Uh, right. So my work, like Holger said, involves um, monitoring and modeling radiocarbon. And we use this, this long-term pasture archive in New Zealand to look at long-term effects of management. Um, and I actually used some of the tools that Holger was working on while he was here in Jena. So first of all, thanks, thanks to Holger. Um, I also want to thank my, my committee and my co-authors on this paper. Um, I'm also a PhD student at ETH Zurich, actually. Uh, Sophie and I have the same advisor, coincidentally. Um, and I'll just jump right into my talk. Uh, so soil, uh, soils store um, the most carbon of any terrestrial carbon pool. And about a quarter of that is stored in grasslands, most of which are managed globally, which means that there's a lot of stored carbon that's directly, um, uh, directly impacted by management decisions, um, both positively and negatively. So understanding how management affects global carbon stocks is a really important question to answer uh, in the 21st century. Um, globally, let's see. Right, great. Um, grazing is the most common management practice for grasslands and where possible and where necessary, um, these pastures are often fertilized and irrigated. And um, in New Zealand, where this study took place, it's quite common to add phosphorus uh, to pastures in order to stimulate biotic nitrogen fixation due to the uh, clover species in these pastures. So adding both phosphorus and nitrogen through just a phosphorus addition. Now, most effects um, of grazing are, are positive in terms of carbon storage. So mostly management actually tends to increase carbon stocks, but the long-term effects of these, of these management in terms of how much carbon they're actually storing can take a really long time to, to uh, observe. Uh, often the negative effects are much more rapid. But understanding what the actual steady state and long-term effects are is really important and can be really difficult to actually observe due to the, the decades required to, to realize them. So these carbon inputs to a, a system can uh, cycle at very different rates depending on soil characteristics, soil moisture, nutrient availability. Um, but ultimately what, what I'm interested in and um, um, what, what I'm ultimately the most interested in is uh, how long the carbon is actually staying in, in these systems. Um, and this is a term that uh, we, we use in this work is, is transit time. And transit time really describes the age of the particles in the output of the system. So you have obviously a mean transit time, so mean age, but then also the distribution of ages is quite important, as we'll see later. So how do we actually measure the carbon age? Um, we use radiocarbon. Uh, there are two sources of radiocarbon. Um, there's radiocarbon that's naturally produced in the upper atmosphere uh, due to interactions with cosmogenic uh, particles. But also in the 20th century, there was a lot of radiocarbon added to the uh, Earth's atmosphere by thermonuclear weapons testing, which nearly doubled the amount of radiocarbon. Um, you know, present in the atmosphere. And over the intervening decades, you can see that this radiocarbon has gradually been incorporated into Earth's carbon pools, into, into plants, into soils, into the ocean. And so studying how this global, um, global labeling experiment, you know, how this carbon was incorporated and the rate at which it uh, stays and then leaves soils, for example, can be really important and tell us a lot about carbon cycling rates. So <clears throat> for example, if a carbon uh, pool turns over uh, quite quickly, say this five-year pool, you can see that it responds much more rapidly and is much more sensitive to changes in the atmosphere, where a slower pool with a much longer turnover or cycling time uh, responds much more slowly and increases only gradually. And you can see in this example that in 2010, those, those pools will have the same radiocarbon content. And after that point, they may actually reverse their relationship to one another. So in order to interpret these data, we need to use a model to, to fit decay rates. And often in soils, uh, it's very rare that you have a single pool of carbon. You usually have two or more pools. And in fact, in this work, 
um, I used a two pool model. Here it comes. Um, this two pool series model. So where all of the carbon enters the fast pool, there's a few parameters that control how long it stays in each pool and how much is transferred to the slow pool. And ultimately we can fit these parameters to fit measured data and estimate the carbon dynamics uh, in each pool. So the site that we used for this research is on the South Island of New Zealand. It's the Winchmore Irrigation Research Station, which is primarily a sheep pasture productivity trial. And you can see in this photo, these, these long strips of pastures where all of these experiments took place. Uh, the soil archiving began in 1959 and ended in 2010. So there's about 60 years of stored soil and, and other data that we can then use to, to understand the long-term effects of these management practices. And there were two main experiments that took place at this site. There's this fertilizer experiment, which in this talk will be represented by oranges and reds and a irrigation uh, manipulation experiment, which is in uh, shades of blue. So for the, for the ir fertilized uh, treatments, there's this unfertilized control treatment, this kind of strange residual fertilizer trial that has a really complete archive that we used, and then also this high fertilization trial. Um, for the irrigated sites, well, there's an unirrigated control, um, irrigation at 10% volumetric soil moisture, and irrigation at 20% volumetric soil moisture. 10% here is um, just above permanent wilting point for this soil, so it's actually quite dry before it's irrigated. And this 20% trial is at about half of field capacity soil moisture by the time it's irrigated, so it's actually maintained at quite high soil moisture. Um, one important thing to note is that all of the fertilized trials are irrigated and all of the irrigated trials are fertilized and not at the same rates. So we don't have a, a true control to compare here. But what's really um, key is that this intensification of management in both trials led to a really significant increase in both above and below ground plant productivity. So it increased the inputs of carbon to these systems uh, pretty dramatically. So if you maintain this high level of productivity over 60 years, we'd expect to see you know, some pretty stark uh, influences of these changes in management. Interestingly, that um, is not exactly the case. Um, all of the trials gained a significant amount of carbon over the entire um, duration of the experiment, but in the fertilized uh, trials, there was no difference in the rate or total stock of carbon over the entire experiment. So all of these sites gained carbon at the same rate despite very different inputs. In the irrigated trials, the rate of accumulation is also the same for each trial, but there's a significant um, amount of, of missing carbon in the most uh, intensively irrigated site. So some amount of carbon that has either not been recovered due to um, from a disturbance early on, or has just not um, materialized or not you know, accumulated over time. So with this data uh, already available, we then asked you know, what, what is actually causing these observed effects? So for the fertilized sites, why doesn't greater productivity lead to more carbon storage? And our two, exper our two hypotheses both have to do with microbial activity. <clears throat> the first is that this greater um, inputs of nutrients and carbon leads to the priming of old uh, organic carbon, which you know is the, a priming effect that's been observed in many, many, um, many locations. And this idea is that with increased um, availability of other resources, bacteria are now able to um, to access and decompose older carbon. Uh, the benefit of this um, analysis is that the old carbon will have a very different radiocarbon signature than any new carbon that is coming in to replace it. Our second hypothesis is that greater nutrient availability just leads to a more active and you know more uh, you know a hotter uh, microbial community that is able to decompose any fresh inputs that are uh, enter into the system. So the more that enter the soil, the more that can be decomposed. On the irrigation side of things, 
uh, a question about that, that really wet site. Why does it not contain as much carbon as the other sites? Um, and our hypothesis is that this constant soil moisture increases you know, constant um, carbon decomposition uh, due to a more active and less stressed microbial uh, community. And then prevention, or then this prevents that carbon from being stored in the system. It's more rapidly respired as soon as it enters. So we analyzed this soil archive. We looked at these six different trials and took 13 different uh, and measured at 13 time points throughout the bomb spike in radio in the atmosphere, um, which gives us a really nicely constrained set of radiocarbon uh, time series. And those are in this plot. Um, like I said, a model is really necessary to interpret them. But one thing I do want to point out in this slide is that all of the radiocarbon signatures in the fertilized trials are um, do, none of them differ significantly from one another over the course of the experiment, which means that there's, it's really unlikely that there was a significant loss of old carbon due to priming um, upon conversion to this management. Uh, if old lost and replaced with this atmospheric carbon, which is much more enriched than radiocarbon, you would expect a very different value, you know, a higher mean value of radiocarbon. So we can rule out that hypothesis you know, based on this, on this data. But um, in, in order to interpret the rest of, of these findings, we need to put the data through a model. So we use this two pool um, series compartmental model um, constrained with both radiocarbon and soil carbon stocks. And we use that to fit four parameters. The first is this uh, decay rate of pool one, which is K1 here. Uh, A2 one controls the amount of carbon that's leaving pool one and entering pool two. And then there's a decay rate for uh, pool two as well, the slow pool. Um, a fourth parameter that we ended up using for this uh, experiment is this uh, slow proportion. Um, parameter, which determines how much of the carbon is stored in each pool at the beginning of the experiment. Since we only had about 200 uh, milligrams of soil, it was not really possible to do any sort of other fractionation to determine the radiocarbon and size of each of these pools. So we use this fourth parameter. If there's any questions about that, I'm happy to return to that um, you know, later. And so then our model outputs then after fitting the, the models and doing some Bayesian parameter estimation, we produce some really nice fits to this long-term data set. Um, and from that, we can then use the, the values calculated from the model to calculate our transit time, which is what we're ultimately interested in. Uh, so to walk through the results, again, in this fertilized site, we saw much higher inputs due to the increased nutrient application, but that didn't really change the size of either of the pools significantly. So if it doesn't change the carbon stock, it must change the rate of carbon cycling. And what the radiocarbon and the model tells us is that the, um, this increase in inputs just led to an increase in decomposition rates uh, in both the fast and the slow pool. So what we found is that adding more carbon into the system only increases the, uh, the respiration of that carbon back out of the system and it, occurs on a pretty short time scale. This, of course, then leads to higher respiration and lower rate of capture of the carbon that's coming into the system. Um, to look at it more, more graphically, we can see the, the greater inputs in the fertilized site. Uh, these pools are about the same in terms of size, so we just see greater, proportionally greater respiration from both of the pools. Uh, this greater transfer to the slow pool observed in the um, in the fertilized site is offset by increased respiration from the fast pool, from the slow pool, excuse me. So our main takeaway is that more carbon in leads to more rapid decomposition. Uh, on the irrigation side, again, there was a step increase in uh, productivity, but the pools actually were smaller in the highly irrigated site due to, um, we can assume due to soil moisture. And instead of increasing in both pools, what we found is that the high irrigation and high inputs led to really rapid decomposition in the fast pool, but actually slightly slower decomposition in the slow pool. 
So if we think about the actual difference between the carbon stored in both of these sites in the dry land, there's a few months in the summer where there's very little microbial activity due to water limitation. There's also no earthworm or nematode activity at this time. So the carbon is preserved due to just lack of microbial decomposition rather than more strong stabilization mechanisms that might be observed in the small but slow old um, or small but slow slow pool in the irrigated sites. So again, much lower respiration from the slow pool, but much faster respiration in the fast pool to offset those inputs. Now, what we uh, set up you know, at the beginning is that the, the transit time, the actual time, the average age of the carbon that's leaving the system is what we're really interested in, in terms of you know, long-term stabilization. And what we found is that increasing inputs led to um, faster mean transit times. So these highly productive systems, the carbon was staying on average much for a much lower amount of time. But these mean values don't really tell the whole story. Um, in fact, uh, you, can, you, know, you can have very different distributions that give the same mean value. So where this story really emerges then is in the distribution of transit times. And what we found here is that both of these trials looked fairly similar, especially once you reached 10 to 15 years of, of you know, transit time in the system. So here on the y-axis is the amount of carbon respired per hectare per year. And then um, on the x-axis, the, the average age of, the, of that carbon and how much of the total carbon is being, is of a given age. So we found is that adding more carbon to the system does not change the amount of carbon that's stored long term, but only increases the short term rapidly cycling carbon pool. So after 10 to 15 years, all of these um, or all of these sites are storing the same amount of carbon that is going to be preserved if you know, on the term of decades to, to centuries and, and beyond. So there is some rate limiting step that's only allowing a certain amount of carbon to be stored beyond 10 to 15 years in these, in these sites. And the more carbon we add to the system, it only res resides in the, in the soil for you know, a rather short amount of time, um, especially if we're thinking about long-term carbon offset. Um, so where does this carbon actually get stored? What we found is that the first or the, the fast pool in every trial reaches steady state. So it, it, you know, it kind of plateaus in terms of carbon content. Um, this, it reaches steady state within the window of the trial for every trial or within the window of the experiment. So that means that this constant accumulation that we observed in carbon content was occurring in the slow pool. And you can see that the, the steady state, you know, the time required to reach steady state is much, much slower uh, in, the, in the slow pool. So this kind of supports this idea of a, a rate limiting step for carbon sequestration in these sites. So here we see the, the fast pool has reached steady state. It's only responding to changes in input, uh, so annual productivity, but a constant linear uh, increase in slow pool carbon. And you, so you can see it's a very straight line. So you know, calculating what the end, the, the final stocks would be is a bit difficult, um, you know, given the, the math of calculating when a, a flat line will plateau. To, to take a step back then and put these results into some greater context, um, we can think about the, the four per mil initiative, which is this, this global idea that if we increase the amount of carbon that is stored in agricultural soils by a rate of 0.4% annually or four per mil, that we can offset a significant amount of anthropogenic uh, you know, fossil fuel carbon emissions and store them in soils in order to, to slow the rate of observed climate change. So again, the goal is then four per mil. And what we observed in our sites is that all of these trials either met uh, or exceeded this, this goal of four per mil. And they, they did that over the course of 60 years. So these, these soils observe, um, exhibited a really uh, 
strong potential for storing carbon. Um, now, it, it has to be said that these soils were likely disturbed and thus lost carbon stocks, but that's, you know, these aren't the only degraded grasslands that um, can be put into management and um, you know, increase productivity and increase carbon storage. So while there are a couple of, of grains of salt to, to take this, these numbers with, um, I think these are really encouraging results in terms of you know, sequestration as a method for carbon um, you know, removal from the atmosphere. Now, obviously scaling these up to much larger areas would have to, have to occur, but that's a, a topic for another talk. Uh, now, the next step then uh, for, for, my, for my work with modeling is actually looking at the, the radiocarbon content of each pool. Um, again, just kind of a, an animation that I wanted to include that I don't have time to get into um, in too much depth. But um, if you have questions about this, I'm happy to, happy to share as well. So to, to wrap up the, the talk then, our biggest takeaway is that increasing carbon inputs did not lead to greater storage in, in these soils. Um, however, these high inputs of carbon and nutrients did not uh, significantly decompose old carbon. So there was no large effect, but rather the, the microbial community was really active and decomposed the inputs rather quickly. Um, and an important number here is that half of the inputs were aspired out of the system within three to five years. Um, and what we also observed then is this rate limiting step to carbon accumulation, mostly controlled by the slow pool. So this might be aggregation, stabilization on soil minerals, these other mechanisms that lead to long-term carbon storage. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions that you have. Uh, thanks.